Well, I think we've got the court here and Mr. Pillsbury. So, Mr. Schweiger, please continue your submissions. I'm grateful, my lord. Before I move to ground two, there's just one short point I need to pick up. It arises from a question of Lord Law Justice Nugi before the short adjournment concerning employment relationship with Farrak. As the court knows, I say I don't need to show an employment relationship with Farrak if I can show that Farrak has stepped into the shoes of the Arcadian subsidiaries. But my Lord Law Justice Nugi asks, well, are there services to Farrak? And my answer to my lord before the short adjournment was that the appellants were performing services for Farrak at Farrak's request to the group. Effectively, they were doing Farrak's bidding. I refer the court to paragraph 109 of the Advocate General's opinion, which concerns the group company point. I should also refer to the court head of the Advocate General's opinion, who makes clear that you can be an employer either where the employee of the other company performs services for and under the direction of the employer, or the employer sues the employee on account of the employee's conduct in performance of his contract with the employing company, i.e., you don't even need to have services performed to the employer in order to count as a Section 5 employer for the purposes of the Lugano Convention. My lords, I want to move quickly now to ground two, and I can take this very briefly because I've covered much of the material already. The rules in Section 5 are designed to be mechanistic in nature. They require certainty and predictability in their application. The concepts of employer and employee are general categories. They do not require an individualized assessment on a case-by-case basis. That's what Lord Justice Sale said in Becker, paragraph 57. The problem with the judge's approach is that his approach, his test, to effectively look at the power over the particular company undermines the scope of the Section 5 jurisdiction. Effectively, it's too open and open-ended, his approach. What he does is he says, well, what power do the individuals have over the company? If it is non-negligible, then they are outside the scope of Section 5. But it follows from that, in my submission, that any employee or any individual with a managerial role would fall outside the jurisdiction of protection. And it's no answer for my learned friend to say, well, you need a fact-intensive inquiry, because a fact-intensive inquiry is the antithesis of a mechanistic, the mechanistic nature of Section 5. And what is interesting is in my learned friend's submission, he now says that Section 5 is not mechanistic. And that is contrary to what he said to the judge below. And it is precisely the error the respondent made, the same error the respondent made to this court at the last hearing in 2016, that Section 5 isn't mechanistic. And the reason why we went to the Supreme Court was the appellants pointed out that, as Lord Manford said in the Law Court of Review, Section 5, or the judgment regulation, is designed to be mechanistic. And one can test the validity of the judge's approach by examining the consequences that flow from his test. And effectively, on his test, any director, any manager, any senior individual with any degree of autonomy or control will be outside the scope of Section 5. So, for example, the judge posed an argument, posed an argument, the example, well, what happens if an individual follows instruction 75% of the time, but does what he likes 25% of the time? In the judge's case, there's no subordination. But my answer to that example would be, what happens if the individual does what he likes 10% of the time, or 5% of the time? Where is the limit? The only way that one can have a conceptual limit is to apply what I call, I call it the Holtzman approach, as your lordships know, it's the same approach in Bosworth. That is, to identify the decision-making body. The fact that the decision-making body may permit or license the individual 
with some degree of autonomy does not mean that that individual is not outside the scope of Section 5. And the upshot of the judge's approach, and indeed my learned friend's case, is that all directors are necessarily outside Section 5. And your lordships heard my submissions on that this morning, but that is contrary, completely contrary to Holton. Whatever one might say of CJD's judgment, it does not say that Holton is incorrect or wrong. My lords, those are my grounds of appeal on the law. And so I move then to the consequences. What follows if I'm right on grounds 1 or grounds 2? Because the judge erred in law and applied the wrong test, in my submission his judgment cannot stand on any view. His treatment of the evidence is infected by error because he simply wasn't asking the correct question. The judge held, as your lords will know, that the appellants had no ability to influence Farahed. My learned friend accepts in his submission that if I'm correct, that would lead to, quote, the opposite outcome from that answer, the answer given in CJD's judgment. And therefore it must follow that if I'm right on this law, the judgment cannot stand and the appeal could succeed. If, however, the court needs to go any further, i.e. that you don't need simply to read the words in paragraph 31, then the question is, how does one approach the evidence put before the judge with the right test in mind? In my submission, this court is as well placed as the judge because on a jurisdiction challenge, that is to be measured hours, days, it's a question of evaluation, not a question of factual findings, as my learned friend says. And more importantly, I can succeed on my learned friend's complete case, the contemporaneous documents that the judge identified, and my learned friend's own evidence. Now there are two points of law which the court needs to bear in mind when it looks at or approaches the evidence. The first is the question of good arguable case. The judge referred to the three limbs in Brownlee at paragraph 11 of the judgment, which again is in the core bundle, tab 5 in the hard copy and beginning page 32 in the PDF. But paragraph 10 is when Sir Michael Burton first looked at what good arguable case means. And the judge was attracted by my learned friend's submission that the effect of Goldman Sachs and Brownlee was in effect to lower the threshold, to make good arguable case the absolute test. And that's not correct. Good arguable case means better of the argument, the relative test. The question is, how do you apply good arguable case? What does it mean in practice? And in paragraph 11, the judge referred to Lord Justice Green's analysis of good arguable case in the case of Typho. And the judge said, well, Lord Justice Green seemed to confuse himself and contradict himself in places. That was unfair, my lord. Typho gives guidance to courts as to how you approach good arguable case when there is contested evidence. So if we go quickly to tab 10 of the authority bundle, which is 217 of the PDF, you can take me briefly. My lord, I very much hesitate to interrupt, but we seem to be investigating what the good arguable case test is. It is not, as I understand it, a ground of appeal that the good arguable case test has been applied incorrectly. I mean, it may be just useful background, but if we're substantively saying the judge got the good arguable case test wrong, that that is not an issue in this appeal. No, well, I didn't understand it to be a ground of appeal. Do you say it is, Mr. Eschwege? The judge did not get good arguable case wrong in terms of the three lists, but the question is if we are looking now at the evidence, 
how does the court approach the evidence? And what the judge did not do, as we're going to see in Kuyper, is apply Lim 2 correctly. In that, what you do in Lim 2... Is that a ground of appeal? Where's the... Where's the... It's not a ground of appeal. Well, it's not... Well, what I want to do, I do not say the judge got good arguable case wrong in terms of setting out the Lim. What I do say is that if now we are going to look at the evidence, we just need to be clear what we do when there's contested factual evidence. And Lim 2 of Kuyper makes clear that either you make assumptions in my favour, or you look at the contemporaneous documents alone to see if that can give you the correct answer. What you don't do is simply rely only on contested witness evidence. That's the only point I want to make at this juncture. But I want to go to Kuyper just to make that good very quickly. Because at this stage of the argument, we're looking at the evidence. And the question is, what do I need to... What can I rely on to show that the judge got it wrong on the correct subordination test? And in my submission, it's conceded to the case contemporaneous documents. And I have the better of the argument on that. That's why the court isn't drawn into the mini-trial that my learned friend wants to put before the court with a sea of evidence. My lord, this is nowhere in the skeleton. But I'm also content for your leave of your lordship's hands. The point is wrong. So your lordship can look at it and establish it's wrong. But it's not in the skeleton or the grounds in any event. Mr. Bilbo, you've made that point. And I understand it. And I'm sure my colleagues understand it as well. If we're going to finish these submissions at 3 o'clock, I think we'll allow Mr. Eschweger to say what he wants to say. I'm grateful, my lord. And very so in Kuyper, it's tab 10. And if we go straight away to paragraph 73 of what Lord Justice Green said, where he explains, it's page 3534 of the case report. And he sets out the relative test, what the Supreme Court said in Dong, Sachs, and Brownlee is the relative test, not the absolute test. And it's limb two at paragraph 78 that I want to draw the court's attention to. And it's in limb two, he recognizes, well, what happens when you have contested witness evidence? What do you do? And Lord Justice Green is saying, well, it's an instruction to use judicial common sense and pragmatism. And he says that where there's a genuine dispute, judges are well versed in working around the problem. And just below H, for instance, it might be possible to decide an evidential dispute in favor of a defendant on an assumed basis and ask whether jurisdiction is nonetheless established. Equally, where there's a dispute between witnesses, it might be possible to focus upon the documentary evidence alone and see if that provides a sufficient answer, which then obviates the need to grapple with what might otherwise be intractable disputes between witnesses. So that's, in my respectful submission, a sensible approach for limb two. There's lots of contested witness evidence. In a jurisdiction challenge, which needs to be measured in hours, not days, see first if the contemporaneous documents give you the answer. Paragraph 79 says, we move to limb three, which is plausible evidential dispute. And you see at the last three lines of the paragraph that limb three arises where the court finds itself simply unable to form a decided conclusion on the evidence before it and is therefore unable to say who has the better argument. So that's where you might look at the contested witness evidence. What you don't do is simply go straight in to contested witnesses. See if you can first get the answer, good arguable case, on assumptions in my favor or contemporaneous documents alone. That's the first point. The second point is this court, sorry, is the court now has guidance on how you approach jurisdiction challenge from the Supreme Court in Octavia. Now that is tab 15 of this bundle. The issue in, which is the PDF 
three, four, five. The issue in Ocardi was how is the court to determine whether there's a good arguable case that the that um, a claim for could be served outside the jurisdiction on a foreign defendant, which was a necessary proper party, the anchor defendant in the UK. The relevant issue there was was there a tribal issue against the anchor defendant, and the courts below engaged in an analysis of um, a number of witnesses, say 43 witnesses, and the Supreme Court said that approach was wrong. What you do is you focus on the pleaded case and um, the contemporaneous documents. Octavi is not confined simply to where there's a tribal issue against the anchor defendant, as my learned friend suggests. If we go to paragraph 20, Lord Hamden talks about the importance of proportionality in any jurisdiction challenge. Um, he says at 21, you need to observe judicial restraint to avoid a trial. And at 22, where, as will often be the case, a permission for service out of thought, there are particular claims, the focus should be on a particular claim. And whether on that basis the facts alleged are true and the course of action has a real prospect of success. He then refers to the fact that in this the question is, is there a tribal issue? Is there a issue to trial? And the Supreme Court then went through this morass of evidence that had been before the court and said, no, look at the contemporaneous documents and the pleaded case. And you see that at 36 when Lord Hampton started looking at the internal documents, which are very important. And if we move on, just for your Lordship's note, Lord Justice Sale was saying at 98 that the issue was, is there a good arguable case? So it's not simply confined to trial issues. And that's obvious because um, the, the question of good arguable case is a jurisdiction gateway. There's not a different standard of um, approach to evidence depending on which gateway you use. And then if we turn to 103, Lord Hamden reiterates the point about jurisdiction challenge and the need to avoid a mini trial. And he says at 103, in general terms, that these proceedings are meant to be defined in the particulars of claim to which Britain's serve was sought out. Then he goes on to say, in this case, the challenge was made on grounds has no argument against the anchor defense. Where, and then he says, in this case, there are particulars that the issue should ordinarily fall to be addressed by reference to the case. 104 is the general point that if you don't look at the case, the key documents, the danger is you slip into a mini trial. And the court, and the Supreme Court, was critical of the first instance judge in Octavi for making what he had described as findings, which you see at paragraph 109. So my Lord, obviously, Harvey is about how do you approach what is a tribal issue against the parent, sorry, the anchor defense. But it goes further than that. It comments on proportionality, avoiding a mini trial, judicial restraint, apply to all jurisdiction challenges. The other point I want to raise um, from a part is its analysis of group companies. Because its analysis of the group company setup is similar, very similar to what we have here. And we can turn to reach the, the end of the judgment. And the, the, the issue, the issue against the claim against the parent, the anchor defendant, was whether there was a duty of care between the parent um, and the claimant. And the parent, the anchor defendant was the parent, the um, foreign defendant was the subsidiary. And 147, Lord Hampton said, considering the question of duty of care, control is just a starting point. The issue is the extent to which the parent did take over or share with the subsidiary the management of the relevant activity. In a sense, all parents control their subsidiary. That control gives the parent the opportunity to get involved in management. 
But control of the company and de facto management are part of its activities are two different things. The subsidiary may maintain de jure control of its activities, but nonetheless delegate de facto management of part of them to emissaries of its parent. And so in my submission, what happens in our case is that Bosworth and Hurley are emissaries of the parent, Farahay. And that's because Farahay invests Bosworth and Hurley with their group role. Bosworth and Hurley, their office comes from Farahay. There's no other nexus which allows Bosworth and Hurley to form their group role. And if you turn then to paragraph 50, there's a reference to what Lord Briggs said in the Vedanta case concerning how group companies are structured. And Lord Briggs says, there is no limit to the models of management and control which may be put in place within a multinational group. At one end, the parent may be no more than a passive investor in separate businesses carried out by the subsidiary. At the other extreme, the parent may carry out a thoroughgoing vertical reorganization of the group's business so that in management terms, they are carried on as if they were a single commercial undertaking with the boundaries of legal personality and ownership within the group becoming irrelevant. Now, we are in that category. The Arcadia group is carried on as one entity. We saw that from the management structure. It's a vertical division. It's done by function. So you can ignore the roles of the subsidiary. Farahead is not a passive investor because Farahead, its only role is to act as the holding company. And we're going to see in a moment when we look at the contemporaneous documents that it has executive function. I must say, Mr. Eschweger, the idea that Farahead is comparable to Royal Dutch Shell seems to me slightly surprising. But anyway. Well, the point is simply that in this case, Royal Dutch Shell has the group board. It's the group board, the expert. Well, it's actually so completely different as to be utterly inapplicable. Royal Dutch Shell had subsidiaries all over the world to undertake their oil business, which were entirely independent in operational terms. And nothing that Lord Briggs said in Vedanta is to the contrary. And, you know, I mean, it's a of course, there's every different kind of subsidiary. But I don't think this passage about this passage about a completely different kind of case helps you. But there we are. It's obviously about optimal. It's about duty of care. The point is simply models of management. Now, my lord, before I move, my lord's friend has two objections to my my submissions on the evidence. The first is, well, the judge made findings of fact. He said primary findings of fact. And therefore, I can't challenge these primary findings of fact. It's a fact appeal. The answer to that, my lord, is the judge did not make findings. In a jurisdiction challenge, when the question is good arguable test, there are primary factual findings. That's what my learned friend said. Rather, there's an evaluation. And we see that from the trust risk case that I referred to in my skeleton. It's a question of evaluation. It follows from that, that if the court is with me on the law, it can intervene. This is not simply a question of giving deference to the first instance judge who has heard evidence or addressed his mind to make a factual finding. The second objection that my learned friend said is that, well, the court can't simply look at what he calls the selection of documents that I rely on. And he refers to the volume of evidence that was before the judge. And he makes the point, well, there were 217 pages of submission. What he doesn't tell the court is that 191 pages of those submissions were from the respondent. They were putting in the volume of submission. And one might have thought that if they were able to show quickly on a jurisdiction challenge, do they have the better of the argument, they wouldn't need to say so at length. So can I turn then to the relevant material? I've got 10 categories. I very much doubt I will get through them all by 3 o'clock. But I can take some of them quite short. They are pleading. One, the group statement of facts, the respondent's affidavit evidence, the formal employment documentation, the PwC memo, 
the information memorandum, the growth policy, the services agreement, the bonus scheme, and the minutes. I rely completely on my learned friend's evidence and the contemporaneous documents. First, the CEDA position, an important starting point. One can't simply ignore the pleading and ignore the pleading's references to an employment relationship as the judge wanted to do very early on in his judgment. I mean, we'll quickly go to the pleading, but I don't have time to take the court through. I mean, I simply don't really understand this. I'm sorry. I must be missing something. If you're right about the law, then the only question is as to the control of, as to whether the individuals had control over Farahead, which they didn't have. Correct. Yes, my lord. If I'm right on that, then, and the court is with me on that, that is the end of the matter. It's only if the court thinks that is not sufficient and we have to go further to look at the evidence that I get to this point. Your lordship, your master of lords, my lord, you're right. But in what circumstances might we have to look at the evidence? As I understand it, Gram 1 and Gram 2 are both directed at the same conclusion, namely that the testing did phosphorus and earth have a non-negative influence over Farahead. That's your case. Yes. Do you know what the answer to that is? The answer is they did not. The judge found they did not. So if you're right on Grams 1 and 2, you win the appeal. If you're wrong on Grams 1 and 2, there's nothing for us to decide. So in what circumstances might we have to look at the facts? The only circumstance would be if the court were to take the view that Arcadia, the reference in 31 to Arcadia, simply meant Arcadia subsidiary. Well, suppose we did think that. Yes. Then the question is, did the court have, did phosphorus and earth have a non-negative influence over Arcadia subsidiary? That would then be the question. The question would be, on the basis of Hogsman 47, what is the relevant decision-making body for the Arcadia subsidiary? That's the point. So you're not simply saying, you're not simply looking at the Arcadia subsidiaries alone. Because remember, at this point in the argument, it's the Hogsman approach, i.e. the decision-making body that's relevant. And if the court were to take the view that Irwell Farahead may or may not be the decision-making body, then we would get to this part of the analysis, looking at the evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. I can take a lot of this very quickly. We've got the pleading, which is in the core bundle, tab 11, which begins at 76. I'm grateful. And if one goes straight away to 9.4 and following to 9.7, one sees immediately that what has been pleaded is that Bosworth is in an employment relationship. And you see that at 9.4, his factual status doesn't change. 9.5.2 makes the point not to stand the limits on his formal appointment or employment position. He's nonetheless a CEO. If you go over the page, importantly, he's invested by Farahead with the office. That's the key point. That's why Farahead is the instruction giving body, the board, what I call the group board, because the office only arises from Farahead in the group structure. 9.6.1 talks about Bosworth being integrated into the company, forms part of the corporate governing structure. Remember those words in Hoffman we looked at this morning about the lasting bond? 9.7, again, references to employment position. None of this is a reference, as my learned friend wants to say, to the domestic employment position. The reason for that is that it never occurred to the respondents that the legal question of employment was relevant. 
What this is doing, 9.4 to 9.7, is setting out the factual basis. And over the page, 9.7.5 makes the same point. Um, there's the same uh, analysis from Sir Hurley, which I don't have time to go through. Um, there are other points from the pleading. I set some of them out in my skeleton um, at uh, uh, 55.2, and also if the court um, is interested um, in um, the submissions I've made on ground three at paragraph six, which is in the court one. Um, so that's the pleading. The Greek statement of facts broadly follows the pleading, so I rely on that. And then we come to the respondent's own affidavit evidence. Now that's in, this is important because that affidavit evidence was given at the time when the claim was issued. And obviously you look at the evidence at the time the claim form is issued. Um, so we go to Mr. Adams' affidavit, which has never been withdrawn, and we see that in the supplemental bundle uh, one. I'm sorry, how do you withdraw an affidavit? Um, say again, my lord. How do you withdraw an affidavit? Well, uh, Mr. Um, Adams could have updated his affidavit evidence or said, um, I do not, what I said previously was not correct. He hasn't done so. That's why he, what he said in 2015. To the court is my learned friend's evidence. And it's important evidence, as I'm going to show your lordship now. If we go to the um, first supplemental bundle, it's 205 in the PDF, um, and it's tab 21. And you see paragraph 1, Mr. Adams. He says, I've been asked by Baroness to act as chairman of the management committee, the de facto CEO of the group. If you turn over to paragraph six, he talks about where he's got his information from, Mr. Fredrickson and Mr. Troyne. And you see at the foot of the page, reference to periodic meetings between Farahead, Bottles and Hurley, in which the latter reported the performance of the group business and on any other material matters. Move on to um, reference, well, we're going to come back to paragraph 25, which is a reference to the group policy, which is an important document. If we go to paragraph 96, and here is the respondent's evidence that Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley were entrusted with considerable day-to-day -day authority and responsibility for the management of the operation. So it's not um, simply um, autonomy full stop. It's considerable day-to-day -day authority and responsibility. And if we go over the page, you see at 99 that in early 2008, Farahead wants to formalise the control structure so it's not simply Farahead having powers, it's exercising its control powers. And it wants to put them in place over Bosworth and Hurley. You see that again at 102. Farahead continues with its efforts to improve the control structure. Um, there's disputed evidence as to how effective that was. But that doesn't matter for the purpose of subordination. Um, if something goes wrong, that might be the reason why there's a claim brought against the putative employee. But it doesn't mean that there's no subordination. If we go on to 103, we talk, there's reference again to focuses on control by Farahead. And 104. Farahead representatives knew Bosworth and Hurley to be experienced. For this reason, they were allowed considerable day-to-day -day autonomy. So the group, the group board permits Bosworth and Hurley to have considerable autonomy. That's though the relevant hierarchical relationship. Considerable day-to-day -day autonomy. Not as the Advocate General Board, total control. Not as CJU Food, total control. Or control, um, full stop. And then finally, 108. Again, Mr. Hannah, the 
Parahead Director is present for improvement in the control and governance structure of Arcadia, and Parahead gives considerable freedom, considerable freedom. We are not in um, the world where Bottles and Hurley have absolute freedom. We're in the world where there is a gap between what the CEO and CFO can do and the board, the group board above them, that set the limits of the performance of their duty. Um, Mr. Hannes, for what it's worth, also says considerable freedom and autonomy. So that, that's the respondent's um, evidence, affidavit evidence at the start, and they issued the claim. The judge does not refer to this evidence at all. That's number three. Fourth, we've got the employment contract, the form of documentation. Now, um, in one sense, they don't really amount to much. They're standard form contracts. They were dry, except they were drafted um, by um, Bosworth and Hurley. All I rely on is that they simply represent the documented employment relationship. Um, for the court's note, Mr. Bosworth's um, employment contract is at tab 40 of bundle 2. A supplemental, uh, tab 40 of the supplemental bundle, which is at page 340. And perhaps we should just quickly look at it to make good my point that these contracts of employment don't delimit the group role. You see Mr. Bosworth's contract, you'll see at number two, employ the CEO of Arcadia Petroleum Limited, that's Arcadia London. So it's not as a group, it's not in the group role. And that's why, that's why it's so important to remember it's the group role we're concerned with. Um, and Mr. Hurley's um, contract of employment is um, at tab 42, which is at 345. The Articles of Association are another um, document that one could look at. Um, they are found uh, at Beg your pardon, at uh, tab 35. Now, we're not going to get much from the Articles of Association because, as the court saw from the earlier evidence, and that is common ground, the subsidiary boards don't do anything in this group structure at Farrahead's direction. All that you get from the um, article is that the shareholders, if you're going to talk in terms of a shareholder, the shareholder power, the shareholder's power. For a county is once a year. Regu um, so if the shareholder wants an account from the director, then obviously it can get that at, at the annual general meeting. I want now. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Sorry. Um, I'm now slightly confused as, as to what was and wasn't um, uh, wrong about the reference to, to the European Court. In the reference, the Supreme Court said. Yes. Paragraph 15, that the appellants, their employees, exercised control over by whom, where, and what terms they were employed. And, and you see that repeated in, in the Court of Justice's yes. judgment. Is that, that wrong? That, is, that was derived from a gloss from the, this Court of Appeals judgment in 2016. And it was accepted that um, that, if you like, binding didn't bind the defendants. Um, well, is, is it wrong? It, it, it is the, ju well, the judge does not say in terms in his judgment, repeat those terms. What he does say is he, he um, reinforces paragraph 14 of his original judgment, which talked about drafting his contract. If you go, my lord, to um, the core bundle, the judgment, so just before we go anywhere, Mr. Eschwager, would you answer my Lord's question? Well, I'm going to do that now. Well, one thing I can say, is it wrong or not wrong? There must be a single word answer to that before you go to a lot of elaboration. It is correct that the defendants um, controlled the terms of their contract, employment contract, domestic contract, in terms of drafting. It is correct that, at least as a judge, they determined where they were posted. That's correct. But that doesn't take you anywhere. Maybe. What's wrong then? 
Well, what is wrong is that if the my lord was asking about um, the record, whether paragraph paragraph thirteen or fifteen of the record was um, still stood, actually it in itself does not stand. No, because that was what the court of appeal at its gloss. We've moved on. It doesn't assist. We're, we're, we're getting closer, but not close enough to an answer to my lord's question. Are the words in the records on your case right or wrong? They are they are right, but you've got to look at what the judge actually found in his judgment, and it, you can see it at he referred to at thirty three thirteen, where he recites my learned friend's point. Um, defendants move their uh, it's in my learned friend's schedule. Defendants move their employment to different arcade, different entities as they consider it expedient. This is the point that my lord, Lord Justice Nugent, was raising. So that's what the judge recalls. And he says, on his um, approach to the test, well, I think there's a good argument case. So that, that, that is actually what is now in the position. What was in section, what was um, in the reference has been overtaken by so what the judge says uh, at 33.13, or recalls at 33.13. Now, my lords, um, I want to move now, though, to the contemporaneous documents. They are important. Um, and the first document we saw... I'm very sorry, Mr. Bishop, I yeah. know you're short of time. Can yeah. I just take you back to the court, court of Justice's judgment? Yes. Uh, paragraph 30, where they recite it. They say, it is also apparent from the order for reference that Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley exercised control over by whom, where, and on what terms they were employed. Was the Court of Justice right in that sentence, or were they wrong in that sentence? They were right in that sentence, save that they did not have before it Farrahead's instruction giving rule. Yes, that this, says, this, says, this says nothing about the instruction giving rule. It simply says that the two individuals exercised control over by whom, which company, where in the world, and on what terms they were employed. And, and they've taken that from the reference. But, but I think your answer to that is, insofar as it says what it says, it is correct. They, the, the Court of Justice was right about that. Yes, but the, pre but the premise, that's what I said earlier on, the premise of this reference, which is consider, um, autonomy and control in performance of your duties, the premise of the reference is that the individuals give themselves their own instruction. The Court of Justice is right um, in what it says in paragraph 30, but because the reference is incomplete, you can't rely alone on paragraph 30. That, that's why there was the remission. My Lord, can I move, yes, can I move to um, the um, PWC memo, which is an important document, because this shows Farrahead's executive function, the group forward wrong. And um, we pick it up, I, I made some reference to it in 56.3 of my skeleton and um, 24 of my supplemental skeleton. And it's tab 48 of the supplementary tomb, which is 367. And you see immediately this is a document prepared by PWC. It's a possible restructuring of Farahead Limited Group. You ought to recall Arcadia Group is a misnomer, it's a Farahead Group. And what Farahead wanted to do was it wanted to minimize tax um, liabilities. And so the question was, how do we do that? Why don't we go to Switzerland and see if we could have the executive functions in Switzerland? You turn over the page, you see there's a reference to AESSA, that's the uh, Swiss company. And the Swiss company has been granted 0% withholding tax on its dividend to Farahead. Why? Because Farahead has a real holding function. We're not talking about passive investment. It's a real holding function with executive function, which you see um, just um, below the whole part. The group is thinking about centralizing executive function. Then there's a reference to what the functions are. A, B, and C. C, you see, these functions include 
the direct Merck Initiatives Trade Group in accord with the Parahead Directive. The problem was, if we go to Switzerland and we set up in Switzerland these executive functions, then we're going to put at risk Parahead real holding functions. It means that the Swiss company won't be able to get a zero percent holding rate on the dividend. PwC comes back to this. This was in March 2011. We turn to tab 50 and see it quite clearly, which is 3885. We see, from again from PwC, about the structuring of the whole group and about the executive functions. And you see in the penultimate paragraph on the first page that a transfer of the executive functions would weaken the holding function of Parahead. That's why it's not recommended. If we go into the page, we see the critical conclusion that was considered at the time. The underlining is from the CEO, who's Mr. Ford. What he says, or what PwC says, is this. Parahead could delegate the supervision of its own directives, corporate governance, reporting, and so on, but the company cannot delegate power to the staff. In other words, the company does not have the power to take any decision for the strategy of the group. It goes on. Parahead, the latter, needs to take all necessary decisions. It has to be in a position where it can supervise and control the work, and therefore documentation needs to be put in place. And you see the manuscript note at the foot of the page. Therefore, Parahead may delegate the supervisory role to the Swiss company, providing all strategic decisions and core matters decided at Parahead level. So the point that is being made is that the executive functions of the group, the group board functions, they can't be moved to Switzerland from Parahead because that puts at risk Parahead's real holding function. And that's why I say Parahead is the group board, because it has real executive functions. And that's why it is the instruction giver to Boswell and Hurd. Let's move on to the next book. You see this in the group policy. The group policy, I only have time for you to go to the final draft, but it's on tab 51, which is at PDF 405. What happened was that Parahead wanted to have a group policy. As the judge found, and he records in his judgment, the group policy is to reflect the will of Parahead. That's paragraph 34, Roman 5. And there were various drafts, and the accountants came in, and they said, you need to be a bit careful about simply recording Parahead directing the group, because that might mean that the subsidiaries have a tax break. And the group policy was changed effectively to minimize or to reduce the language that referred to Parahead's direction and to beef up the decision-making needs of the subsidiaries. We know in the truth the subsidiaries had no decision-making power. If you see the draft, the group policy, there's no dispute that this is the group policy. Maloney's present evidence, paragraph 25 of Mr. Adams, he doesn't take issue with it in any of Mr. Fredrickson or Mr. Hanna. And you see this is a policy document from Parahead. It's to introduce a policy of group practice to be exercised by all subsidiaries. It's to be adhered to, and so on. If you turn over the page, there are three parts. Part one is corporate governance, which concerns the role of the chief operating officer. Part two is CFO, which concerns the role of the CFO, Mr. Hurley. Part three is trade, which is Mr. Bosco. If you look at part two, this is what the group policy says. The group CFO is required by Parahead to ensure trade limits are established, and so on. He's authorized by Parahead. And you can see there's some bold text. 
This bold text is the default role of the decision. For my purposes, I just need to concentrate on Farahead and the CFO. CFO is required by Farahead. Look at B. The CFO is required to provide Farahead um, with consolidated reports. Look at E. Farahead was required uh, presentation of budget. Look at F. The group CFO will be responsible for providing Farahead with an ongoing consolidated report. So all these requirements are about the performance of the CFO. I, the group CFO, will be required by Farahead to do such and such. In the same language you see when you come to the CEO over the page. The CEO is required, are you required by the group board, Farahead, um, to monitor all elements of commercial risk? Farahead, C, requires the group CEO to do certain things. So the very performance of the duties are required by Farahead. This is Farahead intervening. This is not um, a broad instruction. This is Farahead requiring CFO and the CEO and the CEO to do things in the performance of their duties. And likewise, um, you see a D that you know, this, it says, well, he's not permitted to direct the autonomous decision making with subsidiaries, but the subsidiaries are required by Farahead to consult. So the group policy, my submission, shows how this, how this group hierarchy works. You've got Farahead, the group board, requiring um, CEO and CFO to undertake tasks in the performance of their duties. The next document important one is the public documents to the world. Those are the information memoranda, and we see that, we see those um, at uh, uh, at uh, tab 56, which is 445. This document is approved by Farrah. The judge found that, so it's a Farrah head document. There's no getting away from that. Um, it's about raising money on the market for the Arcadia Group. You see at page four of the document that Farahead has reviewed and approved the memorandum. We go on um, to page 36 of the document, which is uh, 442 in the bundle. Um, it's section four. And you see at um, the fourth paragraph, Farahead is established specifically as the holding company. And then you go on to page 38 in the document. Farahead has constituted a management committee. And can you see, recommendations of the management committee are subject to final approval by the Farahead board of directors, i.e. the group board. So that's what's happened. Now, there is contested evidence as to whether or not this management committee ever formally exists. That doesn't matter. Whether it's formal or informal is irrelevant. The question is, what is the relate? How is this group presented to the world? For what it is worth, uh, Mr. Fredrickson did approve this management committee, and you can see that just by um, going to um, an email at tab 55, tab 4 which is 443, and you see the foot of the page, Mr. Hurley asks, can we set up a management committee? In the middle of the page, Mr. Fredrickson says, yes, please. And then Mr. Hanna says, I'm concerned about this, because if we set up a management committee, we will be shifting management and control out of Cyprus, i.e. we will be shifting Farahead management and control out of Cyprus. And that's the whole point. Uh, if there was a management committee in place, then the executive functions of the group would move from Farahead to the management. Just as in the PwC method, the concern was um, if we set up a Swiss company, we're going to weaken the holding function. So likewise here, if we set up a management committee, we're going to shift management and control from Cyprus. This is not the case where you've got a passive 100% owner that doesn't do it. It's got functions in the group. There's a 2012 version of the information memorandum. Um, it is at tab 
Um, and then you go on to the rest of the document, it talks all about the board. Board members, that's by Beth Farahead, the group board wanting Foswick and Hurley to report back to them on the group business. And there's lots, I mean, the, the, these are detailed reports, and the sort of reports you would see to a group board. So, in my submission, when you actually look at the case in the contemporaneous document, and you have in mind the correct test, position can actually be dealt with um, really quite quickly. One doesn't need to get to contested witness evidence. If we do need to get there, assumptions should need to be made in my favour, that just by looking at these important documents made by third parties, documents to the market, the group policy, none of which are um, contested by the respondent, one can see the opposite. And the final point, my lord, is that the judge referred to um, the witness evidence of my solicitor at 2015, where she had referred to Bosworth and Hurley acting as group CEO and CFO. And the judge said that that evidence supported my learned friend's case. The answer to that is that's not correct. When you read Ms. Wilding's statement, all she's saying is that um, Bosworth and Hurley carried out their group role regardless of the domestic employment contract, i.e. across the group. Mrs. Barney says nothing at all about the relevant subordination relationship which we now, which this court now has to determine if you're with me on the test. Melinda Friends Annette made a number of submissions on the evidence. I've, I've um, responded to that in my supplemental skeleton. I don't intend um, to um, say any more about that. Um, then there's the respondent's notice, if we get there. And the short point is, my learned friend's respondent's notice doesn't deal with the Holtzman test. Um, if I'm right in Holtzman and you're looking at Farahead, the group board, then you're not looking at the subsidiary. So, my lord, unless I give you a time, two minutes past three, those are my submissions. Thank you, Mr. Ashwager. Any points, Lord Justice Henderson? Or Justice New J. <coughs> no, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pilbert. My Lord, I should start by indicating the structure of my submissions. It won't come as any great surprise. And I will say this at the outset. If I hit a moment where I don't have to hand the PDF reference as well as the bundle reference, Mr. Heaton will no doubt step in and give it to me, and I'd be delighted if he did just unmute and give the PDF reference if required. I hope I have more, but if I don't, he will do that. I don't mind the tab reference, but unfortunately when you go to the tab reference and then say it's page 35 in the document, then you get lost and you have to do a lot of scrolling down, so page reference is useful. I understand that, my Lord. I don't know whether it's convenient for you to take the break now or to... I'd be delighted to do that, my Lord. Why don't we take the break now, and then the shorthand writers get their break now, and then I will start. Come back at 10 past, please. At 10 past.
Yes, Mr. Pilgrim. Uh, my lord. Uh, uh, so I have four broad areas to cover. I wanted to start by identifying the nature and scope of the appeal, just so it's clear what are the issues, what is in dispute, what is not in dispute, and, and where, where is the focus of the appeal. That's area one. Area two is to focus on the law, on the test of re relationship of subordination. That is ultimately what the main issue here is. What is the test for relationship of subordination? So that's the second area, and that's the, obviously the main focus. Uh, the third area then is, is to look at the judgment below, uh, which we say found the relevant facts to the good arguable case standard, as explained in Brownlee and Goldman Sachs, and applied Bosworth correctly. And then the fourth area are, are the alternative factual contentions that my learned friend puts forward, which is the last section of his oral submissions. And perhaps we'll just park that for the time being, and when we get to that stage, um, consider what to do. So, so those are the four main areas I wish to cover. But uh, since I am a, a historian by heart, by training and inclination, uh, it, it seems to me that there is some merit, briefly, in, in just tracing the narrative arc of how we are here and why, because it is illuminating. It, it tells us something useful, and we will then get into the issue. So what is that narrative arc? You will have appreciated, my lords, that before Mr Justice Burton and the Court of Appeal five years ago, the parties and the court proceeded on the basis that at least as between the defendants and the companies with which they had, as a matter of domestic law, contracts of employment, that they were employees for the purposes of Section 5 of the Lugano Convention. So putting that point the other way around, we, the claimants, did not at that stage take the point to say they're not employees for these purposes. And so Mr Justice Burton and the Court of Appeal ruled on the nature of the claims, assuming that these are employees, are the claims matters relating to individual contracts of employment. Now, in, in the Supreme Court, the court questioned that assumption. If you've read the transcript of the hearing before uh, uh, Sir Michael Burton uh, in September, you will have seen reference to Leviathan rising from the deep to disturb the equilibrium of the mutually assumed position, which was his method of referring to Lord Sumption. But the truth is, uh, uh, all five members of the court raised exactly that question. Essentially, on the limited facts we have before us, it seems pretty clear to us that these two individuals were not employees in the relevant autonomous European law tech sense, and therefore that they were in a relationship of subordination. And since the court had raised that point, the court included it in its reference with uh, um, uh, uh, encouragement and adoption on our part, the court included it in its reference, and so the CJEU was asked that express question, do you require a relationship of subordination, and if so, what makes it up? Now, the Advocate General, when it gets to Luxembourg, for fairly obvious reasons, takes that threshold question first. Are they employees at all? Uh, and he gave his opinion as to what the test is, and of course we'll come on to look at that, and he expressed his conclusion that it was clear, even on the limited materials before the court, that they were not employees, since there was no relationship of subordination. Now, obviously, the Advocate General had to assume that the Court of Justice might disagree with him, so he went on to consider the other, other issue. The Court of Justice did the same thing. It asked a threshold question first, having been asked expressly by the Supreme Court, do you need a relationship of subordination, and what makes it up? It addressed those questions. Yes, you do and this is, this is what you need, and it explained in clear and robust terms, indeed unusually clear and robust terms, seasoned observers of the CJEU might consider, that on the basis of the few pieces of information that they had, it was clear that Mr Bosworth and Mr Hurley were not employees, and the requisite relationship of subordination was not present. And given how clear the situation was, the CJEU considered it didn't need to answer the remaining questions, and so it didn't. So it comes back to the Supreme Court and our position.
position is, well, given how clear the CJEU have been, the point is beyond argument. You should just now dismiss the appeal, dismiss the jurisdiction challenge. And now we come to mention it, those elements of the claim which Mr. Justice Burton originally found against us, all subset of the claims, now it's clear that they were not employees at all. We should be allowed to revive those, and can we have permission to appeal out of time to do that? And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that last bit. You've abandoned them, and it's too late. Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley's position was, well, given the original way the claimants put their case, there's either an issue of stop all, or there's an abusive process. Both of those arguments were rejected by the Supreme Court. And they said, well, in any event, we have further evidence relating to the question of subordination that we want to lead. And there should be consideration of the evidence that we're going to lead on this point. And the Supreme Court accepted that and remitted the matter on that basis. So that was what was remitted. You've been shown the order to hear further evidence and submissions on whether the appellants were in a relationship of subordination to their employing companies or companies in the sense used by the Court of Justice in Bosworth, so as to place them in an employment relationship to which Section 5 of the Lugano Convention could apply. And there is a point that's been picked up in oral argument about the scope of that remission, which I will pick up in just a minute. So that's what's sent back to Sir Michael Burton, as he is, and is by that stage. It's a disputed factual point relevant to jurisdiction, not an issue in the case. No issue in the case as to whether these people were employees for jurisdictional purposes. But there's a disputed factual issue. Is there a relationship of subordination? And in order to determine that, to ascertain whether the English court has jurisdiction or not, it's got to undertake the appropriate way of resolving that. That is, good arguable case in accordance with Brownlee and Goldman Sachs. And the defendants led their evidence relevant to the issue. My Lord Lord Justice Nugent has picked up the point that the judge ultimately makes, that what it was the parties joined issue on. Who calls the shots here? Who's really in charge? That's what the parties joined issue on. The defendants led their evidence relevant to that issue. And it can be summarized, I'd say not unfairly, as follows. Mr. Bosworth says, whilst I was the de facto group CEO, I was in truth no more than a conduit for the wishes of far ahead. Far ahead through Mr. Fredrickson and Mr. Troym in particular, but also through other people associated with them, Mr. Hannas, Mr. Skilton. They in fact directed the Arcadia companies. They in fact decided and directed what the Arcadia companies did. They in fact decided and directed what I did and how I went about my duties. Not only did far ahead have the ultimate right to control me as the 100% shareholder, but they in fact exercised it and interfered in and directed what was going on. Such that, they actually say in their evidence, far ahead should be recognized as a de facto or shadow director of the Arcadia company. That's his headline evidence. And he purported to make that good by a series of examples, instances or episodes of that control being exercised. Mr. Hurley's evidence was very much the same effect, same headline story. And again, then setting out some instances or episodes, he says, that demonstrated that. And Mr. Greenow, the defendant's solicitor, gave a witness statement bringing together the key instances. So here they are. These are the list of examples we show in fact there is subordination. The evidence and indeed the nature and volume of the evidence served by the claimants was driven by and responsive to the evidence served by the defendants. Mr. Fredrickson, his position is summarized in Paris 9 and 10 of the head of his witness statement, but it is broadly to this effect. And you've seen the judge summarize the key parts of it in his judgment. Bosworth and Hurley had and exercised control and autonomy over the day-to-day operations of the business. They had control and autonomy over the performance of their own duties. They were able to and did determine how and where and when they worked. They were 
able to and did determine how the Arcadia Group operated. That is paragraph 9.1 of his witness statement, and it's fleshed out through the rest of paragraph 9.2, paragraph 10 explains why that was the case. John Fredrickson has a major business empire. He bought it, he never bought it on the basis that he was actually going to run it. He bought it so these people could run it. All of that is explained. So that was broadly his evidence, and since the other side, since Bosworth and Hurley, had identified all these specific instances or episodes or examples of the supposed exercise of control, he had to and did go through each one of them to explain why it was either not true, a phrase that you will find used a lot of times in Mr. Fredrickson's evidence, or why it was a mischaracterization or was not consistent with the contemporaneous documents, or why the contemporaneous documents, when you looked at them, actually showed a completely opposite picture. So that's broadly his evidence. Mr. Troy, his business partner at the time, well, the evidence was led about the public and well-documented breakdown of relationship between Fredrickson and Troy, and it was said, he's been approached and we've had no response. Actually, shortly before, or it may even have been on the first day of the hearing, a short statement from Mr. Troy was served that said essentially, I understand it has been submitted that my failure to give evidence supporting Mr. Fredrickson is being said, it's said that that is because I could not honestly do so, and that I accept Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley's story. That is not true. Their version of events is false. Mr. Fredrickson's is true to the best of my knowledge in general terms. Mr. Hannas, who was the Cypriot accountant and service provider, essentially said, the notion that I directed Bosworth and Hurley and told them what to do is nonsense. They controlled the Arcadia companies, which were their own fiefdom, and it dealt with the specific examples relating to him. Mr. Skilton, who's a tax advisor, did the same thing. And Mr. Adams, who was the person who took over after Bosworth and was the original deponent, spoke from his own knowledge of the situation when Bosworth and Hurley were in charge, when they ran the show, and his own knowledge of the situation when he was in charge. The notion that Farhad's actually running everything is nonsense. So that broadly was the evidence one had. Diametrically opposed basic accounts and examples identified by Bosworth and Hurley, listed by Mr. Greeno, each of which was then addressed in turn in an annex to our skeleton argument. Mr. Greeno served a ninth statement to reply to the annex to produce a table of answers, and we in turn responded to his table on our table by adding an extra column. And one has that incredibly lengthy document analyzing each of the examples identified by Mr. Greeno, happily only in the further supplemental bundle at tab six of that, should you ever wish to look at it. And at the court's invitation, as well as dealing with responses to all their examples, the claimants prepared in the hearing a list of their instances examples to bring all the points they'd made in submissions of witness evidence into one place. You'll see that referred to as the Heaton schedule in the judgment. If you're looking in the transcripts, you may find it also referred to as the Parvum office to distinguish it from the Magnum office of the response to Greeno nine. So that's what the problem was. And obviously we will look at the Burton judgment, but you've seen it, obviously you've looked at it. One can summarize it in this way. He says, well, the case for me has been put by the defendants on the basis that Farahan and Fredrickson ran the show and Bosworth and Hurley only did what they were told. And Farahan controlled the activities of the Arcadia companies and they controlled what Bosworth and Hurley did. The claimants on the other side, on the hand, say Bosworth and Hurley called the shots, which is a phrase I think originated with Lord Justice Gloucester in the Court of Appeal. They controlled the activities of the company. They controlled what they did themselves and how and when and so on. And he thought, I can't reliably determine that on an interlocutory basis. I'm just on these accounts. They're mutually irreconcilable. But I have to grapple with it if I reliably can. In the words of, to adopt the Brownlee test, the Goldman Sachs test, I must take a view on the material available if I reliably can. And so the only sensible way to do that 
is to look at the examples identified by each party. Consider those with a good arguable test in mind, case test in mind, well aware that he's not making trial factual findings, he's reaching a conclusion as to whether there is a good arguable case, an evaluative conclusion as to that. That's the only proportionate way to go about it, bearing in mind that this is only a jurisdiction dispute, and I'm only applying the good arguable case standard. And he didn't specifically have Vedanta or Okpavi in mind, Vedanta because it wasn't cited to him, Okpavi because it hadn't been decided at that stage. But he will no doubt have had in mind the exhortation of Lord Justice Davis in the Kiefer case, since that was an authority we looked at, where he says this in paragraph 124, given this is by its nature an interlocutory process, not in any way concerned with a final conclusion on the facts or merits, judgments in such cases should so far as possible be appropriately concise accordingly. So Sir Michael Burton took a proportionate and concise approach. He looked at all the examples, he identified those that were not contested or were common ground, he could take those as read, and for the others, for each one, he identified, if it was contested, the evidence each way, so Bosworth and Hurley, or Fredrickson, Adams, Hanas, and pointed out, in addition, where the evidence of Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley now was inconsistent with the evidence given on their behalf in 2015. And he said, well, if it's uncontested, that's fine. If it's contested, I conclude that the claimants have a good arguable case on that point. So, as a result, overall, I conclude that the claimants have a good arguable case that Bosworth and Hurley had a more than negligible ability to influence the Arcadia Company. And you have to bear in mind the manner in which the case was put to him. It was put to him on the basis that Bosworth and Hurley did not have an ability to influence the Arcadia Companies, because far ahead, Mr. Fredrickson, in fact, did that. They, in fact, controlled and directed. And so, with great respect, I entirely adopt the brief way it was put by my Lord Lord Justice Nugent, what was page 81 of the transcript in its original running form. The question is whether the owners did tell the directors what to do, and he has decided on the evidence, which he had a huge amount of, the better of the argument is that the directors themselves had a non-negligible influence over what they were doing. That's precisely what the judgment does and concludes. So, that is our basic narrative arc. And it's important just to keep that in mind at all times, to get a sense of reality about what's going on here. But there's just one point I want to pick up before turning to the legal text. And that's the point on the position of far ahead. And there was discussion between my Lord Lord Justice Nugent in particular and my learned friend, Mr. Eshwega, about the correct construction and scope of the remission from the Supreme Court. What was the question they were remitting down? Now, for my part, I don't think the Supreme Court ever thought it was remitting down the question, did Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley, were they subordinate to far ahead? Because no one had suggested that. It was never anyone's notion that there was an employment relationship with far ahead. Rather, the role of far ahead was said to be relevant to the relationship with the company. And the defendant's evidence to that effect is collected in paragraph 80 of our original skeleton. If one wants to go over and look at our original skeleton below, which is S16, supplemental 1, 1669 to 170. So, for my part, I don't think the Supreme Court particularly thought that that was the question they were remitting. But for my part, equally, I wouldn't say that the remission is incapable of being read that way, or I wouldn't want to decide the case simply on the basis that that is how one construes the remission. But because the position is actually quite simple when one steps back. The position of far ahead, what's the issue that arises there? As my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent quite rightly said, the clear and consistent learning from Luxembourg is that you need three things, three basic things in every situation if you're going to have a relationship of an employment relationship. 
whatever sphere one's in, and before one gets to the, the differences in jurisdictional spheres and other spheres, one needs provision of services, remuneration, and subordination. And, and there's simply no basis for considering that they provided services to foreigners. In fact, I think my learned friend said that in turn. And, but what actually happened, what actually happened below, well, this was discussed with the judge twice. And I can give you the references. Day one, pages 36 to 42, which you will only find in the further supplemental bundle, number one, volume one, tab seven, 251 to 254, in the context of the judge's questions at the beginning of the hearing. And then at the end of my learned friend's submission, the judge came back to it. And that is a day two, pages 77 to 81, which is further supplemental bundle two, tab eight, 317 to 318. And where that gets to is as follows. The judge said, can I approach it on this basis? If they are not, if Boston and Hurley are not employees of Arcadia London, Arcadia Switzerland, Arcadia Singapore, the Arcadia company, the subsidiaries, if I reach the conclusion that they're not employees of those companies because of their relationship to subordination, I can proceed on the basis that Farahead can't possibly be an employer and I don't need to go on and consider it. If Farahead, if I conclude that the Arcadia companies are employers and that Boston and Hurley are subordinate to those companies, then I might need to go on and consider the discreet position of Farahead to decide whether actually there's any provision of services or remuneration by Farahead at all in the first place. But can I proceed on that basis? Can I proceed on the basis that if I find against you, Mr. Schwager, in respect of C1 to C3, I can ignore C4? Answer, agreed, my lord. And that's the agreed basis on which we proceeded. And that's not being challenged. And there's nothing said to be wrong with that. So the truth is that the Farahead position, it's just been left and then decided by the judge on the basis that it simply doesn't arise. And the other reality of it is, if one steps back to try and work out what Farahead's own claim is here, not as, because it's English, the English law analysis and its losses would be reflected as has been discussed between the parties numerous times. It has only one claim of its own, which is a Swiss law claim qua shareholder in one respect of Arcadia Switzerland's complaint. So Farahead is, in practical terms, largely irrelevant. But for present purposes, the case below was decided on the basis, if Mr. Bosworth and Hurley are not employees of the Arcadia companies, that being the real question the judge was considering, then I don't need to consider Farahead. And so I say, if you conclude that Bosworth and Hurley were indeed not subordinate to C1 to C3, i.e. the judge was right, that there's no basis to go reopening the position as against Farahead. So the scope of the appeal, let's just set up the legal issue before we then look at the relevant legal authority. We all know what we're dealing with here. You need, for Article 20, 21 of the Lugano Convention to get within Section 5, Articles 18 to 20, you need, there must be an employer who brings a claim against an employee in a matter relating to an individual contract of employment. And it's common ground that the employer-employee relationship under EU law requires a relationship of subordination, i.e. one person telling the other person what to do. And it's common ground that one assesses this by reference to all the facts and matters that characterize that relationship. And as we will see, what that really means is one does that on the facts. One looks at the facts and the true position. So with that in mind, just bear in mind that there was not, at least until today, a suggestion that the judge misunderstood or misapplied the principles from Brownlee and Golden Sachs as to how to resolve disputed matters of fact in a jurisdiction challenge. It's a good arguable case there. It's not said that the judge erred in making any particular finding 
applying those factors. We've not identified one that is said to be wrong. It has not suggested that the judge's findings are inadequately reasoned, no doubt because Mr. Bossart and Hurley understand why these points have been decided against them. So that's all taken as read. That's all common ground. So where's the difference? It's on the question of law. My learned friend says the test in Bosworth is actually found in paragraph 47 of Holt's note. So in deciding whether a relationship of subordination existed, one simply asks who had the ultimate right to control the employing entity and whether it was the putative employee that had the ultimate right to control the employing entity. And if not, there's no relationship of subordination. And if that is right, that you just need to ask who had the ultimate right to control, then it is common ground that Farahad had the ultimate right to control and Bosworth and Hurley didn't control or have influence over Farahad. If and in so far as what my learned friend is saying is as a matter of fact, Farahad controlled, not simply it had the ultimate right, but as a matter of fact, it did actually control. That is a factual conclusion which is not established and is, in fact, the judge has gone out of his way to say not established. And so if my learned friend puts it that way, his argument falls down on that hurdle. And so it seems to me the only way he can put it is what you really need to establish is who had the ultimate right to control the employing entity. And we say that's wrong. And rather than summarize the reasons, I'll come on to them when we deal with the authorities. That's our main issue. And it's been made clear today that if my learned friend is wrong on that, if he's wrong on the test, that is the end of the appeal. My learned friend also runs an alternative and somewhat amorphous case that the judge made no findings, certain other findings ought to have been made, and on those findings there was a relationship of subordination. And I'm going to leave all those factual points for now. I will just say this. Within the context of the legal question, my learned friend went to three documents, paragraph 25 of Hannas, paragraph 31 of Adams. And in respect of those, I would just ask the court, if it has any interest in it, to read the entire paragraph referred to, not just the few words selected. And one structure chart, and again, our skeleton deals with structure charts. The judge dealt with structure charts. He said they were draft, unclear, and it never were made clear. They actually reflected reality, so they aren't very helpful. So I'm not going to come and deal with the documentary points and the factual points at this stage, but just bear those three points in mind. So the question of law, what is the test? What is it the judge had to do? Your lordships may find my submissions on this point rather pedestrian in this sense, that my submissions really center on reading out and working through the judgment in Bosworth, looking briefly at Holtzman and a few others, and then reading out and working through the judgment itself, and doing so slowly and with some care. And I make no apologies for that in this sense, and that the answers are there. The answers are in the Bosworth judgment. The answers are in the judge's judgment. And it is a simple case. So in one sense, I apologize in advance for the fact that you may think my submissions are reading out the judgments that are there, but that's because that's where the answers are. Now, my learned friend's case, it may be ingenious. It certainly is based on extracting little bits here and there and piecing them together. It certainly is based on reading a few words here and ignoring the whole. And in order to unpick that properly, that required, as your 
subjects have already seen quite a lengthy and detailed written argument. But actually, if one just steps back, takes a deep breath, looks at the judgments in question and sees things simply, one can deal with it very easily. And it occurs to me, well, one way of looking at my learned friend's position is this. He has taken the one point, or taken one point that is actually factually correct and incontestable, a common ground between the parties and the judgment reflects that, that Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley have no influence over Farahead. That's true. Farahead had its own interest. It wasn't just the shareholder. It was the provider of a very, very substantial financial package to support the trading business, and it was the provider of guarantees that underwrote that financial package, a very substantial financial package. So Farahead had its own interest, which it looked out for and kept an eye on, and it's absolutely the case that Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley had no influence over Farahead. That's common ground. So my learned friend has taken that one fact, that one fact that might be said to be helpful and which can't be contested, and has reverse engineered the test around to say that that is the relevant factor. That is the touchstone, the fact that they didn't influence Farahead. But that is, with respect, just not the test. So one starts with the CJEU judgment in this case. I say it is the critical document, and one can ask rhetorically why. Well, there's an obvious mechanical answer to that. It's because that is what the Supreme Court told the commercial courts to consider, the judgment in Bosworth. But there's obviously a more substantive answer. If one asks oneself, where do I find the answer to the question, what is the test for whether or not a relationship of subordination exists in a situation like the present one, Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley's? The answer is the case in which the CJEU answered that very question, which is, of course, our case. So even if the remission hadn't directed the judge to look at it, it would be the obvious place to go, and so that is where we must go. And as your lordships know, you find it in supplemental bundle, tab 7, starting at page 85, which is PDF page 90. You may have it separately already. So PDF page 90, page 85, printed bottom right-hand corner of the page, is the beginning of the report. And I propose simply to take it in the order it comes, which involves starting with the AG and then hitting the CJEU, simply because that's the logical way through the document. So apparently we start with the Advocate General, which is page 90, bottom right-hand corner, page 95 of the PDF. And paragraph 9, he sets out the facts, the basic facts of the group, London, Switzerland, and Singapore, wholly owned by Farahead, and that they were CEO, CFO, directors of the three companies. Basic facts are there. And let's skip forward then to paragraph 26. So he sets out, he looks at this earlier with my friend, he sets out the question and asks himself whether the relationship can exist when the individual decides on the terms of his contract and has full control and autonomy over the day-to-day operation of the company's business. And note the word full is used there, it's not used by the CJEU. So he asks himself the question, does this exist when they have autonomy over day-to-day operation of the company's business and performance of own duties, even if shareholders have the power to terminate? And he gets onto the substance of paragraph 30 of that page. Paragraph 30, and it's an important starting point, it's an important starting point for him, and it's an important starting point for the Court of Justice as well. It's worth repeating that at the time of the disputed facts, the defendants in the main proceedings acted as company directors for the group, within the meaning of company law. He was de facto chief executive officer, and 
sort of footnote there explaining that you don't really know what de facto director means. It means you're not actually appointed, but you carry on the roles. And Hurley was de facto CFO, and they were de jure or de facto directors of the three companies. And again, you've got the footnote to show he actually understands the facts. They were appointed for certain times to certain companies, but they held those roles for all the businesses. So that's 31. He moves on to 32. He reaches a conclusion that you don't need to restrict yourself to looking at the companies with whom they had a formal contract because it is an autonomous concept, 33. At 34, he sets out his understanding of Holterman, the important parts of Holterman. As regards the independent definition, it's clear from the judgment in Holterman that an individual contract of employment exists where, for a certain period of time, a person performs services for and under the direction of another in return for which he receives remuneration. So an employment relationship, the core elements are those three things, performance of services, remuneration, and subordination. And you need those things to be factually present. You can move on to 36. So the absence of a formal contract doesn't rule out the possibility. Equally, the fact that there was a concluded contract doesn't mean that there was an individual contract of employment. One's going to have to look at the fact, the true situation, the substance of the matter. 37. In the second place, it's clear from the order for reference that, irrespective of the stipulations of the contracts in question, various postings did not alter their duties. They were purely formal. Contracts were drawn up by or under the direction of the defendants in the main proceedings who chose not only the terms but all but the company with which that contract was to be concluded. And all of that remains established, either common ground or to a good arguable case standard. So 38. And this is the section that begins his analysis that leads up to his conclusion in paragraph 46 that is adopted by the court. And for these purposes, it's just worth bearing in mind, and I just mentioned it, that before the CJEU, Bosworth and Hurley, in their written observations, specifically relied on Genosa and Balkaya to say that gives you the answer to these cases. So 38. It's necessary to determine whether the relationships that existed between the defendants in the main proceedings, in their capacity as company directors, and each of the Arcadia companies, whether or not a formal contract existed, may be regarded as an individual contract of employment. This sets up the question ultimately answered at 46. So 39 and 40. Assumption of duties can be viewed as contractual in nature in autonomous sense. It's freely assumed. So the relationship to 40 must be classified as an individual contract of employment. If the director is subordinate to the company in the performance of his duties. 41 then says in Holterman, the court held that for the purposes of section 5, the question of whether a relationship of subordination exists must, in each particular case, be assessed on the basis of all the factors and circumstances characterizing the relationship between the parties. And he gives a well-established conclusion and summarizes what he thinks one can take from Holterman. In that case, the director holding a sufficient share of the capital to influence in a non-negligible manner, the person who's normally competent to give him instructions and to supervise the implementation cannot be subordinate to the company. And he says it's wrong to read that reasoning a contrario. So just because you don't have a shareholding, it doesn't mean you are subordinate. The court has not indicated, indicated in that judgment, a circumstance excluding a subordination in all events, but it is not ruled on the elements likely to characterize it. So what the court has not done in Holterman is to set out a definitive rule. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. The case is taken under advisement.
definitive test to be applied in every situation. 43. With regard to these elements, it is possible to draw on the court's case law in other spheres, the conflict of worker within the meaning of Article 45, and certain harmonization directives. And from that case law and the other spheres, the relationship of subordination is the fact that a worker finds himself under the direction of another person, one that determines not only what work he will carry out, but also and especially the manner in which it is to be carried out, and whose instructions and internal rules and regulations must be followed. This is one I must have bared out in mind when one thinks later of what Justice Burton actually found. So in order to determine that, you will look at, with regard to the autonomy and flexibility enjoyed by the worker in choosing the time, place, and method of performing the tasks entrusted to him. And so did Boswell and Hurley choose the time, place, and method of performing the tasks? Yes. And or the supervision and control which the employer exercises over the way in which the worker performs his duties. So a company director, 44, is subordinate to the company only if he is subject to the effective direction of another person in the exercise and organization of his duties. And you assess that in light of the nature of the functions in question, the context in which they are exercised, the extent of the person concerned, and control to which he is effectively subject within the company. 26, and you see this footnote 26, that that's going to Donosa, it's going to Holton, it's going to all the generic basic elements of a test. But then 45, and 45 to 47 is a little bit of analysis that he himself refers to as a group elsewhere in his opinion. By hypothesis, company directors, such as the defendants, who have broad powers, and so company directors like this, are, with these kind of characteristics, are not subordinate to the company in those duties. In particular, contrary to the argument of the defendants in the main proceedings, and it was specifically argued that, and this is in their submissions to the court in Luxembourg, that by being answerable to and reporting to Farhead, who has the power to hire and fire, was relevant. That was argued by the Boswell and Hurley in Luxembourg, and you can see their submission to Luxembourg, SB 114, 143 to 144, if one wants to go and see what they said in writing to Luxembourg. Contrary to that argument... I'm sorry, I missed that reference. Yes, sorry. Supplemental Bundle 1, if one's having it in hard copy, tab 14, 143 to 144, is the extract from the written observations for Luxembourg. So contrary to that argument, there cannot be any confusion between subordination and the general directive that the director may be given by the shareholders for the orientation of the company's business. Such general directives do not concern the actual performance of the director's duties or the manner in which he organizes them. So they do not concern how to do the job, what people should do and how to do it. The company director is mandated to act for the company and as such may receive reasonable instructions regarding his mission. For the same reasons, the control mechanisms which the law establishes for shareholders do not in themselves point to the existence of a subordination relationship. Every agent must render certain accounts for his principal. Furthermore, the mere fact that the shareholders have the power to revoke a directorship is not sufficient to demonstrate a relationship of subordination. The fact that they have such a power of revocation does not mean that they have involved themselves in the way of directing the company. Here again, in the context of any mandate, a principal may unilaterally terminate the relationship with his agent without this circumstance in itself demonstrating subordination. So this is the power that is expressly picked up by the CJEU. And so it's pointed out to me that the highlighted text in 46, the highlighted italicized text in 46, is taking one back to the language of paragraph 43 
beforehand concerning the actual performance of director's duties or the manner in which he organized his duties. So, then we get to 47. In light of all the foregoing, I am of the opinion that there were reciprocal contractual obligations. So he, even if they didn't have a, a, a formal contract with the Arcadia companies, there was reciprocal obligations, sometimes formalized, sometimes not. But those obligations cannot be regarded as individual contracts of employment within the meaning of Section 5. So sections, paragraphs 45 to 47, set out his conclusion. And 46 expressly uh, is the paragraph expressly adopted by the CJEU. But you will see 48 to 59 is then his reasons supporting that conclusion, in which he specifically addresses uh, um, arguments put by him, uh, arguments put by the defendants in the main proceedings, i.e., Mr. Bosworth and Mr. Hurley, arguments they made in Luxembourg. So, contrary to the argument of the defendants, this is not called into question by the judgments in Denosa and Balkaya. He explains what those judgments are. 49, the interpretation uh, um, which the Court of Justice gives to a concept in one field of EU law cannot automatically be applied in a different field. And he picks up in his footnote uh, some judgments making that point out. As I have indicated, that's what he said back in paragraph 43, he indicated that it is possible to draw on these things. This is only one source of inspiration. The concept of individual contract of employment within the meaning of section five must be interpreted principally by reference to uh, the scheme and objectives of the Lugano Convention and the Brussels One Regulation. And again, he references that to Holtzman and to the general principles emerging from national legal systems. The above mentioned precedents may therefore be transposed to those instruments only with caution. And I would also note that in the judgment in Holtzman, the court did not apply that case law in express terms. It merely referred to it on certain points. And this is a message one sees here, and one sees in a number of other places, that the basic core essence can be transposed, but one needs to do so with caution and having regard to the nature of the context in which one, into which one is transposing it. And, and through 51 to 57, he then explains uh, uh, his conclusion. So, if one applies, applies the Danosa or Barkaya analysis, it will apply to the vast majority of directors. If one does that in a jurisdiction context, para 51, it would result in a large part of the litigation between a company and its directors being viewed through the prism of the concept of individual contract of employment and being governed by provisions of section five. But in many legal systems, that's not the primary way one sees the relationship between directors and their companies. And he footnotes that back to Holton again. And just for your note, in case you're trying to follow that reference down, in footnote 39, he refers to footnote 28 in Holton. If you look in our version, it's footnote 12. That's because the law reporters in the cut out all the sort of mechanical footnotes. But just if you're just trying to follow that reference, you won't be able to do so. Just note it's footnote 12. So, if you include company directors, uh, 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 you will be cutting across company law, you'll be cutting across the way in which one generally views the relationship with directors, and you'll be producing a result in 54 uh, that directors can never be sued together. Uh, um, so, 5354, this conclusion would be at odds with domestic classification uh, 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 and a domestic approach, and it would be at odds. 56, with the jurisdictional rules of uh, 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 the Rome 1 regulation rules on conflict of laws, it would be at odds with them. Another guidance that it uh, would be the wrong conclusion. So 57, 
delighted the above, I strongly doubt that the EU legislature or drafters of the Nagano II Convention intended to extend the application of Section 5 to disputes concerning the civil liability of company directors. The interests at stake in such disputes are, moreover, quite different from the interests surrounding the liability of employees to their employer. The balance that needs to be struck is not the same, and the rules of private international law help to achieve that balance. So, 58, you can't just apply Balkaia or Danosa subordination because that would cause confusion. Now, just pause there at 58. There are a couple of points one can draw out at this stage, and I know we're still only looking at the Advocate General, but it's convenient to pick them up now because they come up again later. So, the definition of a concept in one field of the EU law cannot just be transposed to another, at least wholesale and complete. We've seen the Advocate General here find that in a number of different judgments. If your lordships want someone looking at Holterman, the Advocate General in 25 says the same thing in Holterman. And we see the same thing in the Pillar case, which was handed down a few weeks after Bosworth. It's in the Authority Bundle at Tab 25, and I'm not at the moment suggesting that we go there. Let me just say something about it. It's dealt with in our skeleton, Paragraph 30, Little 4. It's a case under the Lugano Convention. It's related to the consumer provisions, so comparable to the employment ones. It's related to the interplay of consumer for those purposes, for jurisdictional purposes, with the interpretation of consumer in another context, a consumer protection regulation. So it's specifically addressing the interplay between the same concept in two different fields. And the relevant references for your note are Advocate General 41, 46, 49 to 50, CJEU 34, 43. It's put this way by the Advocate General 49. To sum up, it is possible to take other legal instruments of EU law as a basis for the interpretation of the provisions of the Lugano Convention or the provisions of EU private international law in general. Those instruments may therefore provide guidelines for the interpretation to be given to concepts contained in those provisions. However, in the context of such an interpretation based on other legal instruments of EU law, care must be taken not to draw undue conclusions, and you have to consider the provisions of private international law provisions consistently with their purpose and objectives. So employment rights cases such as Donosa and Balkaia are not the answer. They provide, of course, a source of the basic underlying principles. One requires services, remuneration, and subordination. They are the beginning, but they are not the end in jurisdictional terms. And Mr. Justice Burton was correct to proceed on that basis. And the criticism to the effect that Mr. Justice Burton, or Sir Michael Burton, did not follow those binding authorities is misplaced. Yes, of course, they are binding on him, but in general terms they are, and they do not govern the situation before him, as the AG made expressly clear and the CJEU made clear by the fact it didn't refer to any of these authorities at all. And we explain, I think, this is possible, Justice Nugent. I think we've lost Mr. Justice Nugent, but he's returning in a moment, he tells me. Lord Justice Nugent. Yes. From my point, he has been frozen for quite a while, so that may... When he comes back, I'm sure he'll tell us what he lost. I think he was there when you started talking about Pillar, so hopefully we've got the references there.
did you drop off after Mr. Pilgrim was talking about Pillar and gave the references to the paragraphs in Pillar that he wanted us to look at? No, it was before that. Before that. Okay, well, going back again, was it before he made the point about transposing that it was not possible to transpose the principles wholesale from one area to another, but you had to do so with some caution, which is what the judge did? No, it was before that. I will pick it up from the transcript. Okay. All right. Don't worry, yes. Very good. Keep going then, Mr. Pilgrim, please. Yes, my lord. So, we explain in our skeletons, paragraph 30 to 32, that the other cases my learned friend relies on are also comparable employment rights cases, and they don't actually assist us. And these authorities are deployed to make a series of false points, present false dichotomies. For example, my learned friend's skeleton, paragraph 39 to 3, says, well, the CJEU says, see Vechtler, that's in the bundle, see Vechtler, that if you're not employed, then you are self-employed. So, by finding that Mr. Fosworth and Mr. Hurley were not employees, Mr. Justice or Sir Michael Burton has found that they are self-employed. That is a classic example of the deployment or the misdeployment of the case law being deployed in a totally different sphere. That is a case about the interaction between principles of freedom of movement, freedom of establishment on one hand, and domestic taxation rules on the other. CJEU makes clear authorities to tab 26, paragraphs 42 to 45, which is page 699 of the PDF, that in that context, the context they're considering, where it is necessary to decide whether you fall within the category of employed, and therefore free movement of workers applies to you, or self-employed, in which case free movement of persons, freedom of establishment, and freedom to provide services applies to you, they are binary. That is the case in that context. They are binary. If you're not one, then you are the other. But that tells one nothing for jurisdictional purposes. A conclusion that Mr. Fosworth and Mr. Hurley is not an employee for jurisdictional purposes doesn't lead to the conclusion that they are self-employed for jurisdictional purposes, let alone that they are self-employed for any other purpose. So it's a totally false dichotomy by extracting a case in one area and trying to impose it in other areas, in another area. So the cases on other spheres should be treated with caution. The general principles, the essence of employment, services, remuneration, subordination, that is consistent across the board. The general principle that you need to judge the case in all the circumstances, that means factually, that is consistent. But beyond that, one needs to look at the particular context. So that little diversion took us away from the Advocate General's opinion, which we're just finishing, paragraphs 59 and 60. So 59, his interpretation is not called into question by the fact that the rule does not distinguish between categories of employee. He's not suggesting that the court should draw distinctions between subordinated workers that are not contemplated by the drafters. He merely proposes to construe the concept of subordination for the purpose of the application of that section in a way which accommodates the particularities of company law and the realities of social mandate. So he's not dividing the concept of employee, and he's not engaging in what Lord Justice Sales in Petter considers, which is an assessment of relative bargaining power in any given situation. He's simply just construing the concept of employee in the context of the Lugano Convention. And so he reaches his conclusion, paragraph 60, which is his dispositif. He is repeated at the very end of his opinion. So that is the Advocate General. It's very clear, very helpful. And let's just see how that 
placed her into the CJEU judgment. So on at page 114 of the hard copy bundle 119 of the PDF. So it sets the relevant scene, identifies paragraphs 3, 4, 5, the relevant provisions. 6 and 7, key summary of the facts. The three companies owned by Farahead, CEO, CFO, directors, and we've seen the greater detail in the Advocate General's opinion that they're all aware of, obviously, about de facto and de jure directors. We've got all that. And they're employed by the directors of the three companies, party to contract of employment with any one. And all that remains common ground. But one can skip over their account of the procedure and the questions, because the lawyer has seen those already. Skip over their attempt to reopen the oral procedure. And it starts then at para 20. We're going to, para 20, we're going to consider the threshold question first. 21. So it asks itself the question by reference to the terms asked. Is there a relationship of employment, a relationship of subordination, when the person is able to determine or does determine the terms of that contract? Yes, para 8, Burton judgment, that's established. Has control and autonomy over day-to-day operation of that company's business and performance of his own duties? Yes, just for reference, good arguable case on that. But the shareholder company has the power to procure termination. So that's set up the question. He says, they say 22, you can look to the regulation from the convention. They're comparable. Obviously, you can, clearly right. 23, you have to work out whether there is an individual contract of employment, whether they can be classified as employees. And C, in that regard, a Holtzman. Let's note what's being referred to there. Para 34 of Holtzman. In that regard, any classification cannot be determined on the basis of national law. Greed, again, referred to Holtzman, para 36. It's got to be autonomous. Holtzman, para 37. The concept of employee, there is a consistent, the court has consistently held, it's got to be defined by reference to objective criteria which distinguish the employment relationship. And the essential features are services, remuneration, subordination. They're being, performing services under the direction of another person. And that's, yes, gets taken to Kiski. And if one goes and follows up the reference there, one sees it is taking you to all standard cases. That is the basic guts of it. So an employment relationship implies the existence of a hierarchical relationship between the worker and his employer. That's who the hierarchical relationship is with. Which must be assessed on the basis of all the factors and circumstances characterizing the relationship. And that's gone to Holtzman 46, Sindicato 42. Absolutely right. So if one's thinking about my learned friend's arguments on the basis of Okapabe, that you should only look at certain things, this relationship must be assessed on the basis of all the factors and circumstances characterizing the relationship between the parties. It's that the court is focusing on the actual, actual fact of the hierarchy and the giving of directions, specifically in relation to the manner and performance of duties. And I just ask you to note at this stage, it's only got, well, it's 25 and 26. The first 25 is misnumbered as 24 in our report. But when the court later, when we get, for example, to BU and Marx 24, when the CJU is looking for a statement of the essential principles, not specifically in the situation of directors, but just generally what are the basic guts of employment relationship, it goes to Bosworth and it goes to these two paras, 25 and 26. That is the basic principle applicable in all circumstances, three limbs, judged in all the facts. At 27, you don't need a formal contract, but you do need 
a relationship of subordination, 27 and 28. And that is, because one looks to the substance of the relationship, not the legal form, not governed by the terms or the written documents. One looks at the substance of the relationship. One gets to 29. The court's judgment from here is striking in that, unusually for the CJEU, it doesn't just simply identify the test or what the national court to consider or suggest what other facts would be relevant to its analysis. It's apparent from its reasoning that it thought it had all the information it needed to make a determination. It says, even with only these things, I can reach a conclusion. And it does that in definitive terms. The 29 and 30 identify the five key factors and circumstances. CEO and CFO of Arcadia Group remains common ground. Directors of C1 to C3 remains common ground, not contested below or before or at any stage. Party to contract with an Arcadia Group company drafted by themselves or at their direction, well, that's established. It was found originally, it can't be contested anymore. So no argument about that. And they acted at all material times on behalf of all Arcadia Group companies, not contested. 30, it's apparent from the, they exercised control over by whom, where, and on what terms they were employed. Again, we have a good arguable case under that. That's what's been found. So, you know, my learned friend skated over these paragraphs, but they're important. Even on these five things, you've got no relationship of subordination. Because you see over the page 31, in the circumstances, on the basis of just those five matters, it appears that one can conclude that Boswell and Hurley had an ability to influence Arcadia that was not negligible. And that, therefore, it must be concluded that there was no relationship of subordination. And just pause there for a second. So even on those five matters, you can see no relationship of subordination. See to that effect the judgment of, and gives you Holtzman the reference. Now, in light of the emphasis my learned friend placed on to that effect and the import of to that effect, it's important to note what it says in the original French, the language in which this judgment was actually written, which is, voir en ce sens, see in that sense. So it's telling you to look, telling you about non-negligible ability to influence. See in that sense, the judgment in Holtzman. Do we have the French text? We do not. But in light of the focus put on it, I've checked what it is. But I can certainly provide the French text. And I'm sure Mr. Heaton will, as we speak, be ensuring that that is sent to the three clerks. Yes, please. I think, Mr. Pilgrim, you're at a fairly crucial stage. But I think it would be undesirable to break any later because you're going to have to tell us what you say about the important succeeding paragraphs and paragraph 47 of Holtzman. So I think we'd better do that in the morning if that's all right. My Lord, I'm, of course, in your hands. We will do that in the morning. You're making good progress, as I affirmed. My Lord, yes, I need to finish this judgment, tell you about the following paragraphs. I need to make some observations about Holtzman. I want to make a few points about what one can learn from DU and Marx 24, the most recent one, just quite how that deploys some of this learning. And then one needs to look at the judge's judgment to see what he does with it. So absolutely. Well, that's very good. Well, we'll do that in the morning at 1030 then. Thank you very much. Thank you.